Okay, uh, so as Richard said, I um, am uh, the co-founder of the Ada Initiative, which is a US non-profit um, aiming to increase the participation of women in open source and other open technology and culture areas. And I'm also a PhD student at Macquarie University um, trying to finish up that last 10% that takes so much time of any major project. Uh, I'm not really going to be talking about either of those things in today's code, uh, in today's keynote. Uh, perhaps a little bit university will get to that. What I am talking about is changing the world with Python. Um, so I know not everyone here uh, is uh, considers themselves an open source developer. You don't release your code into the public and so forth. But I'm one of those people who started out learning about open source uh, culture and ideals probably several years before I started writing any kind of code that ever worked. Um, and when you start out like that, this is kind of what you think open source is like. That, um, yeah, that you will single-handedly save the world and wear tight tops. Um, and, and a stern expression. Yeah, so you think of it as a, as a pretty heroic um, endeavor sometimes, that you're making code that will be used uh, outside of people who can afford proprietary software, outside of people who have um, resources to, to uh, get boutique code developed for them. Maybe you don't think of yourself exactly like this guy. I mean, there's alternatives. You know, you can think of yourself as one of these people. Um, you know, I think of myself as the as wooden spoon girl over there. Um, so that's sort of you know, all, uh, if you um, depending on where you come into open source culture, uh, in particular people who. So I started reading about. Um, the Hacker's Dictionary and so forth in when I started university at the end of the 1990s. Um, if you come across Jamie Zawinski's writings too soon, you think open source development is more like this. <laughs> but for people who don't know of Jamie Zawinski, he was one of the original Netscape developers and he was behind or a large part of um, the push to get uh, what is now Firefox, open sourced, um, and then he promptly left Netscape and bought a nightclub, which he runs to this day. And I think this is actually a photograph from the DNA lounge. Anyway, so that's kind of you know where you, where you might have come to open source from, thinking, okay, I'm going to be a hero and I'm going to party all night. Um, and I guess if you're Anthony, that might be true. <laughs> but for the rest of us, there's this disappointing realization when suddenly you realize you're spending a lot of time. Uh, more in this kind of environment. Um, uh, and then every so often, just take a second to adjust the mic properly. Uh, um, we'll see how it goes this time. If it falls off again, I'll use the lectern mic. Um, yeah, so you're spending a lot of time uh, in environments like this, and every so often you take um, take a weekend off uh, and you spend time doing this. Um, so, what I'm talking about in... Maybe it is better to use the lectern mic. Yeah? Okay. Um, Okay, I'll switch that off. Okay, um, right, so I'm talking about uh, restoring your heroism with, um, with a touch of Python. Uh, so I'm going to talk about four projects uh, in the Python space today. Um, for people who were in Brianna's talk, this is maybe a little bit like that, um, except four projects instead of one. Basically, projects you might want to consider contributing to or investigating further if you want a little bit more of the wooden spoon and less of the cube farm in your Python development. The first one uh, I'm going to talk about and probably devote the most time to is a project called Plover, probably the least well-known of these projects. Um, has, anybody, has anybody here actually heard of the Plover project? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so that was about three people for the benefit of the audio. Um, right, so for the rest of you, 
Um, a little bit of background on this. Uh, so what you see right at the top there is um, a standard what's called Steno keyboard layout. So Steno is, um, is the typing mechanism that people use for extremely fast speech transcripts like court um, people who transcribe court proceedings and people who, co who close caption television live to air. Uh, the mechanism you use to type um, is called cording. You hold down multiple keys at once. Uh, each key press, it depends on the dictionary you use, but each key press corresponds to usually about a syllable rather than a single letter. Uh, each combination key press that is. Uh, you can customise the dictionary so in court reporting where there's a lot of jargon and so forth you might um, have a single uh, a single chord that you've defined to be as much as, a, as, much as an entire sentence. It's arbitrary. Um, so traditionally this is taught um, in quite expensive technical courses, stenotyping, uh, and the entry level machines to do it cost something, I believe, something along the lines of $3,000. Um, but in principle, there's no reason why you can't do it, assuming that you have a keyboard that can register enough presses, which luckily uh, have been developed a lot for gamers who have similar kinds of styles. Um, so the cheapest one, the cheapest, it's called the, um, the requirement is called an N key rollover, uh, sometimes called anti ghosting, I believe. Uh, the cheapest is the Microsoft Sidewinder X4, which is about, I think I've seen it for under $60 in Australia, um, undoubtedly, you know, 10 cents in the United States maybe. Um, uh, so Plover is an attempt to bring stenotyping to standard keyboards, so that is um, making both the entry open source and making, um, <clears throat> making the equipment extremely cheap. Uh, so the reason this helps save the world um, is that uh, extremely fast typing is, so it's a benefit for, for a lot of us. Um, so to give you an, a sense of what I mean by extremely fast, uh, unless you do a lot of dedicated sitting in front of your computer for multiple hours over multiple weeks, uh, most people, I think, plateau. Who here knows their QWERTY typing speed and it's faster than 60 words a minute? Maybe 15, 20 people. Uh, anyone faster than 100 words a minute? Okay, there's, I see one. Um, so uh, it's a little bit hard for the steno people to tell because mostly it's taught full time in technical colleges. You take a, a two year course where you do nothing but do this and that brings your typing speed up above 200 words a minute. Um, I think the world record is somebody who can type 350 words a minute. Um, but the estimate of the woman who founded the Plover Project, a woman called Mira by Night, is that most people with the kind of effort that a lot of us put into learning QWERTY, which is, you know, a few, a few weeks to a few months with typing exercises and not, you know, not eight hour days, um, but, you know, an hour here and there over six months, that most people could reach 100 words a minute. Um, that's around about the speed that most people reach when they drop out of steno courses because they, they realise there's a big difference between 100 words a minute and the 220 you need to be a certified court reporter. But on the other hand, for the people in the room who didn't raise their hand, except for that person up there, uh, 100 words a minute would be um, faster for your typing. So there's that, but the, uh, the one more change in the world aspect for that, aside from making typing faster, um, is that for people who rely on text for communication, so people who are entering stuff in order to be able to speak, who, um, who need to enter text in order to produce text-to-speech output, the faster the better, basically. It's really, really hard to reach conversational speed. Um, I think... I think I'm, pro so I don't know what I'm speaking right now, it could be as much as 300 words a minute. Um, uh, so for anybody who, anybody who needs to take down my speech, which is court reporters, or anybody who would like to talk to me by typing and having it read out, uh, fast typing is, um, is a hell of a benefit. So I'm just gonna have, just have a, this is one of those moments where I have a video and it could be a problem. Um, so this is Miro by Night, who is a trained 
stenotypist um, who has a typing speed of over 220 words a minute using so she's using she's using the plover tool and she's using um, one of the Microsoft sidewinder keyboards here so she's not using the very high-end hardware that she would use professionally um, and she's entered an online typing race okay so it counts down and go. Every craft and every investigation and likewise every action and decision seems to aim at some good. He uh, hence the good has been well described as that at which everything aims. However, there is an apparent difference among the ends aimed at. For the end is sometimes an activity, sometimes a product beyond the activity. And when there is an end beyond the action, the product is by nature better than the activity. Uh, 213 words a minute. Um, so, that's Steno, and that's Plover. Uh, she has a number of YouTube videos, five or six, demonstrating um, uh, herself using Plover. Um, sometimes you can see her hands on the keys and so forth. Okay, so the thing about Plover is, so first of all, most of you have never heard of it. Second of all, Mirabai funded it out of her own pocket. She found a guy who programs Python living downstairs from her in New York. Um, and, she pay, and she paid him all the money she had because she had this vision of open source Steno. Um, so they've gotten it to the point where it works as an input mechanism on Ubuntu. Um, you install this Python program and you get your Microsoft Sidewinder or other N, N key rollover keyboard um, and you can do Steno. Um, so there's some obvious holes in that. For starters, not everyone uses Ubuntu. Um, uh, there's also a great deal of learning curve to go. So, so me telling you about this um, is very cool, but I've known this for a year and I haven't gone out yet and learned how to enter Steno, even though I have a PhD thesis to write. <laughs> so there's a hell of a lot of work left to do, and as far as I'm aware, Mirabai has run out of funding. Um, so the kind of stuff they need is, well, it needs to be ported to more operating systems. Um, there, is a, there is a competing tool already for iPad, um, but tablets in general and are an obvious next candidate um, because typing on them is particularly horrible. Um, at the moment, you can edit the dictionary by opening up. So the dictionary of chords um, is a giant text file in a particular format, and you can edit it in a text editor if you want to. Uh, what would be really nice is some tools that make that slightly more pleasant, as in, you know, you don't open it up, scroll down to where you want to put in your new chord, put it in, put in the letters it translates to, um, and then have to test it to see if it conflicts with other chords that have been entered elsewhere in the dictionary, um, because it's, it's a very good idea not to have ambiguity. Um, so there's a whole bunch of tools that need to be developed around editing the dictionary. <clears throat> One thought I had was actually that they could, um, they could stand to have something that suggests you appear to enter the sequence. Um, I guess my research is, uh, convincingly argues that a lot of times um, you could stand to make a chord for it. Um, so something that actually uh, logs your keystrokes and recommends that you turn certain commonly typed sequences into a chord would be a really nice tool. Um, and finally, in order to get people over that hump of, oh, I have to learn to type in a whole new way, even though I heard about it in this Python keynote and it sounded kind of cool, um, it needs to have teaching tools. It needs to have at least you know, the equivalent of Tux Typist for Linux, which is a standard teaching tool. And Mirabai is sort of hoping that something like Frets on Fire will eventually, eventually have a steno version where you, where you have to type in order to get the music to play. <clears throat> so that's, um, that's one way you could save the world with Python, um, by, uh, by contributing to letting people type faster, and not just programmers, but people who, uh, people who use their computers to talk, and people who use their computers and typing as their only means of interpersonal communication. Okay, um, and that's the URL. There's a development mailing list already. There's a blog, including some relatively elementary at this stage introduction to how to learn Steno and how to read your dictionary and that sort of thing. Um, I think uh, Mirabai must have spent a fair bit of money on it at this point. Um, 
I guess as a I guess as a sort of a side note, I believe that the people who can do this at, at over 200 words a minute uh, often command seven figure, no, not seven figure, six figure salaries. Um, uh, you can easily earn, I think, 150,000 US because there's just not a lot of people who spent three years in technical college learning to type at 240 words a minute. Um, so that's where she got the money from. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, the Software Carpentry course. I'll do this at the beginning of everyone. Who's heard of the Software Carpentry? carpentry? Again, fairly small number of people, um, but more than, more than plover. Okay, um, so this time you'd be saving the world by helping scientists. Um, so there's a little bit of that going on at this PyCon, in fact, people talking about scientific programming in Python. That's not quite what Software Carpentry is doing. Um, so Software Carpentry is headed by a guy called Greg Wilson. Um, in his latest introduction to Software Carpentry, he says that he talked to scientists um, about, f they estimate um, that they spend about 40% of their time, this is non-computational scientists, so uh, people who are doing massive data analysis and so on. They spend about 40% of their time working with computers to try and get at their data somehow, often programming now. Um, and 96% of them say that they largely taught themselves everything they know about software engineering or everything they don't know. Um, uh, why not write unit tests? Why not use version control systems? Um, the physicist answers, what's a version control system? Okay, so to be fair, you can have these conversations with working software engineers as well. <laughs> um, and uh, as somebody who's a, who's a computer scientist, you can definitely have this with computer scientists a lot. Computer scientists are really bad, largely, not all of them, are very bad software engineers. Um, so software, uh, software carpentry is basically a giant curriculum on the, um, they call it the 90% of software engineering that gets you the 90% 90 of the way there, essentially. So it introduces version control, um, it introduces unit tests, it introduces useful languages, including Python, but also simple spreadsheet programming and so on, um, to get people that, you know, to get people working in science, um, you know, using tools that have been developed in the last 40 years or so in terms of software engineering rather than either reinventing them or much more commonly simply not having anything, um, anything of the kind. So you get people who can't replicate their experiments because they don't have the code or they don't have that version of the code anymore. Um, you get people who can't replicate, who can't work out uh, why their experiment doesn't work this week because they can't revert to last week and they don't have any unit tests to guarantee that their code works the same as last week. Um, so saving the world with uh, the Software Carpentry project uh, mostly involves contributing to their lessons, which um, are distributed free, uh, open online, um, and are open source. Uh, so you can simply debug the lessons, watch the videos, and work through the worksheets, and, and send Greg Wilson errors whenever, um, whenever you discover a problem. Um, they also are keen to have other people produce lessons, so they like them to be three minute videos essentially. You write a script, um, you make a, a short video, they'll edit it for you, um, cut it all together, um, put up a transcript. Um, and you can give any variation of the course at, well, it's aimed at university people. Um, sometimes I, the course is accessible to undergrads, uh, most likely aimed at introductory people who are entering grad school. Um, uh, the full course, I think, probably runs for, is aimed at an entire semester. They have a compressed one week version and a compressed three day version and so on. Uh, and they're also keen to have people um, offer to give that course. That's probably more accessible to academics. Universities are, in my experience, not overly friendly to people turning up and saying, I'd like to give a course. Nice as that would be sometimes. Anyway, Software Carpentry there, uh, producing um, tools, uh, Python community associated tools for, um, for scientists to learn software engineering. Um, okay, next tool. Okay, Calibar. More of you have heard of Calibar? Yeah, we get, we're getting there. I'm, I'm hoping this is a, a linear increase. Um, so, Calibar is an ebook manager. Um, uh, 
it won't literally help you save books from the fire. We'll we'll get to saving books in a second. I have a I have a special for Richard there. Um, what Calibre does is simply making make managing your ebooks a bit easier and get you a little bit more out of the clutches of um, of individual ebook vendors. Um, uh, the core calibre, for obvious legal reasons, does not actually break um, digital rights management on your books, but it does allow you to centralise them in one place. It does the rather nice thing of converting um, EPUB format ebooks to Mobi and vice versa, uh, m mostly in order to counter some of Kindle's evilness, um, that it doesn't read the most common format. Um, so contributing to Calibre, um, it's it's mostly straight out. This is this is you like to fix bugs involving strings, basically. If you if you're if you're one of those people who um, who has always always dreamt, like you wake up in the morning thinking, "Gosh, I hope I come across a Unicode bug today because I love those ones." <laughs> um, you should be contributing to Calibre. Um, they also, uh, I don't think they actually actually call for this on their own website, I have to say, but almost everyone I know who's had something to do with Calibre says they release soft, they release constantly, they release every week, they have more features for pulling data out of some ebooks and stuffing it into other ebooks and so forth. Um, what a shame that some of the buttons, like the, the selection of buttons across the top actually scrolls off the right hand of your screen. So if you've got a small screen, you can only use half the functionality um, and things like that. So uh, if you're interested also in, in um, GUI development and user interface design, uh, you could uh, help save the world contribute to Calibre. Okay, uh, that's their website. Um, definitely worth using if you have doing any ebook reading at all. Okay, uh, a very brief non-Pythonic interlude. Rich is not even paying attention. This has a picture of a cat, especially for him. Yeah, right, we have a picture of a cat to go for Richard as requested on Twitter last night. So, uh, a project that's not written in Python, very quickly. Distributed proofreaders, people have heard of it? A little bit? Um, they, they basically do Project Gutenberg now. Um, they provide maybe 90 or 95 percent of the books coming into Project Gutenberg. Basically, people scan books, they upload the scan to distributed proofreaders, um, heaps and heaps of people go to the distributed proofreader site, so the, uh, the acronym there is Project Gutenberg Distributed Proofreaders .net, P -G -D -P. Not easy to remember. Um, uh, people check the people check the um, optical character recognition. Um, I think they do five separate passes now. Like so, five separate dedicated proofreaders have to read every ebook. At the end of that, it gets uploaded to Project Gutenberg. Um, I stuck this in here because it is a little bit more directly saving books from the file, uh, where the file is um, copyright claims by people who um, have released new editions. Um, so Project Gutenberg distributes books that were published before 1923, and by far the easiest way to prove that is to get a copy that was printed before 1923, um, and those are slowly disappearing for obvious reasons. Okay, so um, if you literally or more literally want to save books from the fire, you could drop into distributed proofreaders. Um, but the, uh, the code that drives the site while it's open source is written in PHP, so that's why the cat was angry. <laughs> Okay, last of all, uh, sugar. Um, so people who've heard of sugar, the uh, sugar, the uh, learning environment for originally for the one laptop per child project. Um, so, right. Um, so this is helping children, which is obviously helping save the world. I don't know whether I need to develop that argument any further. We have a cute child on the screen, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Anthony would like to save the cat. <laughs> okay, cute children. Um, so Sugar is a, um, an innovative uh, collaboration oriented um, learning environment for sort of children up to primary school age. Uh, it's very focused on um, collaboratively editing documents. Um, uh, it has the cute feature that you can access the while you're actually using your. Um, it's not only for OLPC now. Uh, you can get it on a USB stick and stick it in any laptop. 
um, that you can actually click on something and there's the source code that's running on your laptop in Python and you can actually edit sugar if you're a, a small child and you have small enough fingers for those keyboards you can actually edit um, the edit the code as you go um, so it's a pretty big project. It's basically a window manager on up through an incredible number of applications, which they call activities. So it's got a wide range of stuff you can do for them. Um, they still have a lot of core environment development. So if you're interested in hacking on window manager level, display level kind of stuff, there's a fair bit of that going on. There's activities, which is the writing and chatting and web surfing and doing maths collaboratively tools. Um, in particular, they have a little project called Math 4, which is teaching, um, teaching grade 4 level mathematics. Um, and they have infrastructure, which is running their website and all that sort of thing. It's a big enough project that they have a dedicated team of volunteers working on their website and working on their presentation and so on. Okay. And that's where they are. They're at Sugar Labs. Okay, um, and if you didn't, and then at some point somebody will consider you cool enough to invite you to their special party at their open source nightclub. <laughs> okay, uh, so that brings me to the um, the end of my my four projects you could contribute to in Python in order to do your bit in saving the world. Um, I just have some quick thanks. Uh, I wrote this on the Ada Initiative's time, so. Um, their sponsors are listed there. The, the high-level sponsors were Linux Australia, Puppet Labs, and DreamHost um, web hosting. Um, and last of all, my husband, Andrew Bennett, who dug up, um, I think, two of these projects for me um, and criticized my choice of images for the, for the talk. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. No? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, okay, at the risk of possibly turning this into a yak shaving exercise, um, you've mentioned four projects here which would benefit from having Python hackers join in and, and mm -hmm. contribute. There are 300 odd of us here and the 270 odd who aren't already contributors to a large open source project um, would possibly flood those four if they all turned up tomorrow to contribute. There is obviously a lot of open source contributors who aren't in this room what's the best way to coordinate effort here? I mean, is, is there, you, you said that your husband had to bring you two of these projects. I'm sure there are, for everyone on there, another thousand of people who, who would like help doing their thing. They aren't, aren't Python technical and want the assistance. How do we coordinate that effort better? Yeah. So I have to say I'm suspicious that not everyone in this room is immediately going to join one of these projects. So I'm, I'm, hope, I'm, hoping, that, I'm hoping that that will save. Um, so I think, just to give you an example, so sugar could probably absorb everyone in this room if you all suddenly turn up. Like it might be a little bit of a thing for them, but they could probably absorb you. I wouldn't recommend that everyone goes and volunteers for Plover um, because they had 10 posts to their mailing list last month and uh, 300 of them might scare them a little bit. Um, in terms of recruiting people to projects, it's, I have to say that's a really good question. Um, I don't know of any really good mechanism for, to, um, at the moment to identify, you know, um, somebody turns up and they say, I want to be an open source hacker. What project should I join? Um, and that is kind of the eternal mentoring question in open source because it's really hard to answer. You want a project, um, I'm reasonably sure all of these projects are living and actually accept patches. That's the first thing you need to check. Um, that they all actually want contributors who aren't the main author is another thing you need to check. Um, but it would, be, it would be really nice to have a kind of a edited clearinghouse of open source projects that need contributors, um, matching them up with skills. I know, you know, SourceForge has tried and um, I wouldn't be so... Like they, Another one with Fresh Meat or someone... Yeah. 
Yeah. But if, if anyone, uh, so yeah, my email address is there and we want this for the Ada initiative too, because we want to be able to provide this kind of stuff to women. If anyone's aware of a good mechanism of, of joining enthusiastic people with projects that have holes in them, uh, that would be, or, or wants to develop one, that would be really cool. Yeah, all right, I'll repeat it back yeah, for that. Yeah, you said that software carpentry wanted videos. Mm -hmm. Say hypothetically that I'm not either an aspiring actor or an aspiring producer. Um, like what sort of videos do they want? Is that just talking heads or somebody out of whiteboard? Or uh, so the question is, what kind of videos do um, does software carpentry want, uh, given that most of us aren't actors or video professionals and so on? Um, what they mostly want is uh, two things. They want short lectures, so that is a bit talking heads. Like they want you to point a camera at yourself while you talk for three minutes about um, about the software carpentry issue of your of your choice. Uh, they will edit it for you, and you're supposed to write a script in advance. So the idea is that um, uh, that eff effectively you're following your script. You make a mistake. You just pause for five seconds so that they can cut the video appropriately, and then you just resume. That's one type. The other type that they want is screencasts, so pictures of yourself typing a Python program or using a spreadsheet while talking about what you're doing. Um, and so that second one, especially given that you write the script in advance, is probably something easier to contribute if you're not really comfortable in um, doing our head to camera kind of video. But that's the kind of thing they want people talking about software development for short periods of time. Um, but one of the options is screencasting yourself using a tool. Come up here, Richard, who's this? Thank you, Mary, for that